What's up, Kingdom Fam? This your boy, Remnant Warrior. I'm here to tell you about my brand new 11-track album, Remnant Army. This has been a labor of love for sure. That took me about a year just to record and almost as long to produce. Like all my music, this album was created to give praise and honor to the Most High God and you truly get a glimpse into my life with the music on Remnant Army. Because although it is a New Covenant Records production, I produced this album myself, so it has a mix of songs written exclusively to and for my family. It's got banging Christian hip-hop, Christian truther-themed collaborations with Christian alternative artists like Christopher Pageant and his band Three Nails for the King, and of course, praise and worship music to the King. You can purchase this album at 150 different online or brick and mortar stores for $10.99 a piece, or you can email me directly and buy a digital download of the album from me for a discount of 50% off, which is $5.99. I hope that you will take the time to check out this album, if not by buying it, at least by streaming it. I've been working on this album for almost two years and it is finally here. I'm so excited to share it with all of you. I want you to feel the presence of the Holy Spirit when you listen to the tracks on this album. I want you to get to know me better by the music, and I want you to know that you're not alone in this world, and Jesus can transform your life. I hope that my music can make a difference in your life, and most importantly, introduce you to the one who died for you, Jesus Christ the king of kings you can purchase the album now for only $10.99 just click on the link below or you can get your own digital download directly from me for half price just contact me at remnantwarrior84 at gmail.com remember spread the word share the album Keep the beat banging and the fires of worship burning. Jesus is King. Feature from Jekyll Island, which recounts a secret meeting that took place in 1910 on Jekyll Island, a stretch of white sand beaches and beautiful landscape off the coast of Georgia. It was an exclusive gathering of American financiers, politicians, and banking elite who covertly plotted the draft legislation for the creation of the all-powerful central banking system that not only financed both world wars, but has become an accomplice in the support of totalitarian regimes throughout the world. An excerpt from the book claims that, quote, there are few historians who would challenge the fact that the funding of World War I World War II, the Korean War, and the Vietnam War, was accomplished by the Mandrake Mechanism through the Federal Reserve System. An overview of all wars since the establishment of the Bank of England in 1694 suggests that, 
Most of them would have been greatly reduced in severity, or perhaps not even fought at all, without fiat money. It is the ability of governments to acquire money without direct taxation that makes modern warfare possible, and a central bank has become the preferred method of accomplishing that. We theorize a strategy dubbed the Rothschild formula, in which the world's money cabal deliberately encourages war as a means of stimulating the profitable production of armaments and keeping nations perpetually in debt. This is not profit-seeking, it is genocide. It is not a trivial matter, therefore, to inquire into the possibility that our elected and non-elected leaders are, in fact, implementing the Rothschild formula today. While there's been some movements to combat this globalist totalitarian network, which has not only financed communist revolutions around the world, such as in Russia, China, and more recently in South Africa, which were all triggered by engineered social uprisings aimed to remove existing power structures using class warfare and amplifying socio-economic and racial tensions enforced by a banker-controlled media. We can see the same pattern played out in America today, where manufactured civil unrest is used to erase history and promote cultural Marxism, in a nation which already promotes falsehoods in schools, starting from its name, which was not really based on the explorer Amerigo Vespucci, whose authentic name was actually Alberigo Vespucci, who only changed his name to Amerigo after his voyages to the Americas. In other words, Amerigo came from America and not the other way around. Not only was there an existing tribe in Nicaragua called Americ, whose root word was the ancient name for the land used by the natives of Peru, also known to the Maya civilization and attributed to the great feathered serpent creator deity, which they called Kukukan, a deity which also had an equivalent by the Aztec civilization. According to Manly P. Hall, in his book The Secret Teachings of All Ages, quote, these children of the sun adored the plumed serpent, who was the messenger of the sun. He was the god Quetzalcoatl in Mexico, Cucamatz in Quiche, and in Peru he was called Amaru. From the latter name comes our word America. Amaruca is literally translated land of the plumed serpent. The priests of this flying dragon, from their chief center, they once ruled both Americas. One of their strong centers was Guatemala, and of their order was the author of the book called Polpulvu. Many Mesoamerican and native Indian tribes also record in their oral traditions encounters and conflicts with giants, or at least very tall people in the past. I also covered this topic in several videos, showing documentation regarding many discoveries of giant skeletons which have been published in newspapers, and then seemingly forgotten to history, except for mythology, or mentions of giants in the Bible. In many biblical interpretations, the serpent is synonymous with Lucifer, the fallen angel thrown down by God, which literally translates to light bearer, a symbol which can be found in many parts of the ancient, pre-Christian world. In his book, The Occult Connection to the Hidden Race, author Ken Hudal proposes that, quote, then perhaps the land of the plumed serpent may also be known as the land of Lucifer, concluding that America means the land of Lucifer. While this interpretation may sound like a real stretch for many, it's an interesting concept when considered from the perspective of an interview that I recently stumbled upon, suggested to me by one of my subscribers, which uncovered some interesting details regarding the secretive meeting on Jekyll Island and events that led up to the creation of the Federal Reserve. The gentleman being interviewed is Tim Bentz, and the host of the show is Rob Skiba from a broadcast on Blog Talk Radio titled Canaanite Altars and the Federal Reserve. But now let's listen to a brief excerpt, and I'll leave it to the listener to draw their own conclusions. I knew something about Jekyll Island. I, I had looked at some of the financial issues uh, in the 80s and 90s. I was looking at some of the uh, spiritual applications to uh, financial things, but I really did not was not up to speed on the history of Jekyll Island. I had just heard it. From something I'd not even read, you know, the book that's called *The Creature of Jekyll Island*. I'd not even read that book, but I was aware of something about Jekyll Island and financial stuff. So, so I, I, I went in my brother's house, got my computer out, and I just, you know, got on the internet and typed in Jekyll Island. It's like, what's going on with Jekyll Island? And so, uh, I discovered when I got online that the Jekyll Island Club, which was this historical um, you know, multi-millionaires 
country club that had been built in the turn of the century, it had just been remodeled and reopened. And I thought, wow, that's interesting. When I got to the hotel, it was about 9 o'clock at night. And, um, and so I, I went in the restaurant and had a good meal and uh, went to my room and got some rest. And the next morning I went down for breakfast and uh, a different different lady was at the desk, but she she had a note for me and said that I that I had an appointment arranged with the uh, museum director and that he was blocking out most of the day to spend with me. So I had my breakfast and then when I went, I went over to meet with him. So I go meet with the museum gentleman. His name was John, and when I go meet with him. I uh, just introduced myself. I told him a little bit about who I was and what I do. We started talking. Uh, he was, of course, started out talking about the financial stuff because this Jekyll Island is where the Federal Reserve banking system was birthed and conceived. And at, at one time when it was functioning in the 1900s up to the 20s and 30s, uh, uh, some say one-third, some say two-thirds of the world's wealth would vacation on that island. Mm-hmm. It was the highest conglomeration of wealth in a single place very often anywhere in the world back in the turn of the century. So uh, it this seems like a little island that's not anything significant at all now, but it's amazing to see the financial side of the history of that spot. And so I, I'm sitting there looking at some of the the things that he's telling, and just thinking about some of the things he's telling me. We went out, walked around, and he showed me some of the cottages that had been restored, and the the club itself, and the the rack, the tennis courts, and you know the, they had a pier where the boats would come up. And he's just kind of showing me the grounds, and then we go to the museum, and he's talking a lot about the financial stuff and the guys that built it and each cottage was, you know, marked and named. Some of them had been restored. Some of them didn't exist anymore, but they had like a sign that this is where this one was, and that one was built by J.P. Morgan, and that one was Rockefeller's, and, you know, that one was uh, just, they they had each one of them named. Well, they're all kind of native names, and then they're all, you know, got some kind of a plaque on who the financial mogul was that had built them. And... They're not really elaborate, luxurious mansions. They're just simple cottages for the most part, which was kind of interesting to know that the richest people in the world built them and they were very low key and almost like a you know cabin in the woods instead of a luxurious house like you'd expect. And they all had Indian names. So I started asking them about the Indian history of the island. And he lit up. He just was like, that's what he really wanted to talk about because he loved the Indian history. And so he, uh, he he takes me back to the museum and he said, we got a lot of stuff on the Indians. He said, this was uh, actually a, like the uh, government um, main, uh, main community for a tribe of Indians that don't exist anymore. And that tribe was called the Tim Yukas. And I said, well, that's interesting. My name's Tim. And uh, anyway, I didn't know anything about the Timucas. I'm from Oklahoma. I, I've learned a lot of Native history, and I have some Native bloodline, but I did not know anything about the Timucas. Um, so I just asked him, please tell me everything that you can tell me about them. I want to. There's something about the Natives that I feel like I need to know. So um, he said, "Well, the Jekyll Island Club was actually built on top of." everything that the Indians had. So they just kind of wiped the village out and built a club on top of it. So wherever the chief's house was, there was a cottage now. Wherever the council house was, there was now the Jekyll Island Hotel. And he said everything that's built and visible today was is actually sitting right on top of something that was significant in the Indian village when it existed. So he said the fact that this whole place had to go into ruins and then be rebuilt and become an archaeological state park, he said it actually helped us identify the Native history because the club itself had almost erased that. Mm -hmm. 
And so I said, well, you know, let's look at the museum. I want to see some of the Indian stuff. So we're looking at arrowheads and spear tips and, you know, just artifacts that they had found and pottery shards and things and seashells that they had had. And he showed me all their stuff in the museum. Um, he, he shows me some fragments of a weapon that was like an unusual bow. And when I say unusual, I mean that it was a, a like a double curved bow, and that was a very unusual shape of the bow for a native tribe. I had never seen that shape before with an American Indian tribe, and I've seen a lot of bows and arrows. So I asked him. I said, "This seems unusual. I've not seen this before." In Oklahoma, every native tribe, the bows would look like a single bow or just a, a single curve. I said, this is quite extraordinary, especially as far back as this tribe was. So um, he said, yeah, we found a lot of weapon-type artifacts that we, we've not seen with other tribes. And I said, well, how do you know these were Native Americans? Maybe they were from somewhere else. He said, oh, no, 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 they, they were, they tell me, because they, you know, they, they're well-established along the Florida and Georgia uh, coast. And he said, we got a lot of stuff in, in three or four states about them. And they were quite prolific at one time. So he said, we know they're Native Americans. I said, well, all right, what else you got? He said, well, we got some skeletons. He said, do you want to see this, the bones? And I said, well, yeah. You know, that sounds, you don't get to see a skeleton very often. I said, are they where we can actually see them or are they buried? He said, no, they're visible. So they had a burial site that they had been very respectful for when they built the museum. When they found a burial site, they didn't move the bones. They left them where they were, and they just uncovered them to where they were visible, and then they built the museum on top of them. They did basically the same thing with the museum that the Jekyll Island guys had done with their houses. They put a piece of plexiglass over the burial site so you could see it, but they were still trying to respect where the bones were and not move them. And so I'm looking at four skeletons of the Timuca chiefs. And uh, they knew they were chiefs just from different things that were buried with them. So all of a sudden I look and I realize, man, these guys are really tall. And I commented to the guy that, you know, how tall are these guys? They look unusually large. And he said, yeah, they're all about eight or eight and a half foot tall. I'm like, well, that doesn't seem like a normal Native American, especially the tribes that I'm familiar with. He said all the Timucas were unusually tall, even the women. And he said we found other skeletons and you know parts parts of bones out in the grounds, and he said uh, we've got pretty good evidence that nearly all of them were extraordinarily tall. And I said, well, what is you know. What do you, how do you explain that in relation to other tribes on the Atlantic coast who were not? He said, I don't know. It is an unusual anomaly. He said, oh, by the way, I've got a painting that you might want to see. It's actually the copy of the original. We've got it under lock and key. But he said, i got a painting that, that actually shows the Indians uh, from a, a, a group of French colonists that came to the United States uh, before it was the U.S. This was right after Columbus. He said that it was the first colony of French uh, folks that came over to try to establish a colony on their coast. And he said they landed in Jekyll Island, and they had some interaction with these Indians. And then they got so uh, appalled by what they saw and witnessed that they fled at night and ended up in San Augustine, Florida, and established that city. So I said, were they the Huguenots who were the French group that established St. Augustine? He said, yes. I said, well, I'd like to see that painting then. So he pulls that out. I'm looking at it, and it shows the Indians and all their regalia, and they're dancing around and having some kind of a ceremony, and it's got the fire, and it's got just, it's a typical, either they're having a party or they're having a war scene, and and it, it has... Um, some things with the weapons, so I said, gosh, this has got some weapons in it that clearly validates the archaeology that they found, and then I see an altar, 
and I'm going, I don't know of a Native American tribe anywhere in the country. I know some that had log houses or high places or worshipped, you know, nature in some way or had totem poles or that kind of stuff, but this one has a stone altar and it looks a whole lot like the one that I had dealt with in the Middle East. And I'm looking at the picture and I'm going, is this an altar, is this a stone, like something they're sacrificing on because this guy's holding a baby in his hands in this picture. He said, yeah, they're cutting those babies, they're hacking those babies up in that painting. And so what, when you look at the detail, two of the shamans or chiefs are holding a baby up by the ankles and they're whacking their heads off and spilling the blood on this altar. Mm. And I'm like, sir, I I don't want to be disrespectful of your training and archaeological understanding and history, but I don't know of any native tribe that did what I'm seeing here, unless it was an act of war. And this is really, really unusual. And I've seen this type of scene with artifacts over in the Middle East. And I've seen weapons like this over in the Middle East. I said, are you sure this is Native Americans and not some kind of colony that came from over there? And he he was convinced they were Native. And I said, well, I'd like to show you some things on a few websites that identify artifacts in the, in the Middle East countries, and especially Egypt and Israel and Syria and Jordan area, and I, some of those spots where there's some of these ancient groups. And I said, these, this type of altar this type of religious ceremony and some of these weapons, I've seen them before over there. Well, he was quite interested in that because he loves Native American history, but he's starting to question, well, maybe I need to dig into this more. That's, that was his comment. So I said, at that point, then I thought, I believe this is why I'm here. I needed I needed to see this and, and hear about this. Um, you know, at this point, I'm not that concerned about the financial stuff anymore. I'm wanting to know where is this altar. And so I asked him, I said, can you, can I, can you take me to this altar? Uh, I often pray over these things, and it's very beneficial for the land and for the country and for the people. Can Can I go to this altar and see it? He said, I can take you to the altar, but you can't see it. And I said, why can't I see it? Is it buried? He said, no, no, it's not buried, but it has a house built on top of it. I said, who would be crazy enough to build their house on top of a blood sacrifice altar? He said, well, Rockefeller was. So, you know, I just like, okay. Uh, can we go there? And he said, yeah, it's just a short walk. Come on. And we've actually, you know, had already walked by it. So he said, uh, I've got the keys. He said, normally nobody can go in. Um, they, the, the, the way these things are set up, they're historical homes now. The state of Georgia owns the park. Uh, they lease it out to another group, the hotel, to run. But the houses are maintained on the National Historical Register. And they're part of the state park. So you can't go in any of them without a guided tour or permission, but you can go look in the windows and walk on the porches and walk all around them. And they're they're set up inside just like they were when they were actually being used in the back in the twenties and and earlier. So uh, we we go over there and he's got the keys though. So we go into the house and he takes me into the parlor. And he says, well, I know you're you're a praying guy, so you probably would like to have a little time to pray. He said, you're standing right on top of the altar right now. This is the room that is built on top of it. He said, I'm just going to go over here and sit down for a few minutes and read the newspaper, and I'll let you pray and do whatever you need to do. Now, this parlor, that's where where those guys, J.P. Morgan and all those guys, actually conceived of the Federal Federal Reserve, right? Right over that altar. That's exactly right. It's the room that they were sitting in when they drew up the the uh, 
the entire legislation and plan to pass it that became the Federal Reserve Act. Wow. So this was the conception of the Federal Reserve Banking System on the parlor sitting on top of a blood sacrifice altar. Where babies were sacrificed. Yes. And so all of a sudden it's like, wow, no wonder our banking system has so much corruption in it, even when people want to do the right thing, you know. No kidding. Uh, and so, I, you know, just being a banker is not an easy job, but it's like not all of them are bad guys, but it's like, wow. And that was not what our founders set up. That took over it. You served the authority of the way our founding fathers suggested that we bank as a country. And even the way it was passed had a lot of, you know, things that didn't seem right about it. Um, but the the idea that it was conceived like this, I'm going, this is not just a bunch of wealthy guys that got away for vacation and came up with a profitable business plan. This has got something diabolical, something occultic about it, something evil that's wrapped up with it. Yeah. And so even if... Even if it had been a good idea and something beneficial for the country, which many would argue that it was, um, this demonic power must have gotten into it because they didn't just create a bank. They created a banking system that every one of us have, have become subject to. So, so think about this. We've got a piece of money that wouldn't be of any value whatsoever if we didn't attribute value to it. Our dollars are only worth something because they're measured right. against something else. And the problem right. worldwide is every nation today, every nation is operating with fiat currency, and we're the ones that taught them how to do it. The change that the Federal Reserve did was not just to change the facial picture on the money. What they did is they took the right that our Constitution gave to the Treasury Department to print the money and set the value there. And they said, let us print it for you, and then we'll loan it back to you. Right. Well, think about the stupidity of that. If, if you just think crazy. wisely, I'm already making something with my own hands, and then somebody else comes to me and says, let me make that for you, and then I'll loan it back to you. you know? At interest. Why would I? Why would I do that? You know, it's mine to start with. I don't need you to print it for me and then charge me interest to have it. But that's what we did. We set that up on a national scale. And and where was the voice of the righteous when that happened? Why was there not a public outcry? It forces us to have debt or we have no economy. Yeah. You cannot buy anything in this country without a debt being created because if you buy something, that's the reason they print a dollar. So right. you buy a house and you ask for a loan, they print the money so they can give you the loan. That creates debt whether you are borrowing or not. Every sale, every transaction, every exchange has to create a debt now to be done. So that is not necessary, but it is something we chose to allow. And unfortunately, due to technical difficulties, the show uh, cut off right about this point in the broadcast.